Welcome to ND and Me, a podcast to share NDA's lived experiences. So hi, Tim. How are you? And who are you? Well, I'm doing fine. And uh, I'm, uh, well, Tim Goldstein uh, here in uh, Colorado in the USA. I live outside of Denver. And I am autistic. Was diagnosed when I was 54. So I went through uh, most of my life uh, not knowing uh, quite why uh, the world was the way the world was. Uh, my working assumption at that point was the world was stupid. And uh, and I wasn't, except for my few geeky friends who, looking back in retrospect, were probably autistic also. And uh, once I was diagnosed, I uh, made it my uh, special interest to learn about autism. So for those of you familiar with autism, of course, special interests, you understand. I dove in deep and my wife got to the point of uh, continually telling me, can't you talk about anything but autism? And the answer was no. <laughs> and as I started to study it and understand more and understand you know, what it really meant, I came to the realization that it isn't that the world's stupid. Now, there are stupid people in the world. Well, you know, just be clear about that. There are some out there that do things that you just have to question no matter what perspective you look at it from. Yep. But overall, it's not that the world was stupid, but we had a very ineffective communication style between the two of us, the way that the majority of the world communicated and the way that I communicated was, uh, I, I like to say that we had a, uh, a mismatch of impedance. So if you, you come from the electronics background, that makes sense. And if you don't, uh, it just means that uh, the two sides hooked together in a way that uh, just did not functionally work through the interface very well. And that really led me to uh, you know dive into understanding what this communication gap was. Uh, you know, I am you know, I, I, I hate this term, uh, you know, of high functioning, or uh, I prefer the older term Asperger's that, you know, isn't really used anymore. But it defines, you know, kind of how I present much closer than probably anything that we use now, you know, saying level one says, you know, nothing. So, you know, I was able to get by in the world most of the time fairly well, but things would happen occasionally and uh that would usually lead to getting fired and then uh you know something else would happen and it would lead to getting fired and it had nothing to do with skill set it had to do with things that to me were just baffling things such as telling the truth about what was going on you know why would you get fired for telling the truth about what was going on you know that was totally baffling to me at, at the time but as I started to learn more of, about what was going on, the reality was I, like many autistic individuals, uh, don't communicate through emotion. I communicate through logic. And I figured out eventually that most of the world communicates through emotion first and then the logic after they've interpreted the emotion. So if the emotion says bad things to them, it doesn't matter what you say logically they're going to hear bad things because, you know, as humans, we only see and we only hear what our brain's looking for. So if we've already decided emotionally that what we're looking for is, uh, I don't like this person, this person's causing problems, we're only going to see problems. Uh, in spite of the fact that there may be things that are problems there, uh, maybe even things that are very, you know, very strong, very uh, good things for the group, organization, person, whatever it is. So from that, as I you know, learned more and more, it, it became quite obvious that uh, th there was a number of things going on in the communication that caused the challenges, the breakdowns of, that I had experienced through most of my life. So I decided that uh, you know, I didn't want people to have to suffer through the same thing I suffered through. Uh, not that you know, my career was bad. I, I had lots of uh, good points, but you know, calling your wife and saying, you know, honey, I, I got fired again is not really a very fun thing to do. Uh, she was quite understanding, but, you know, it's still no fun. So that, uh, you know, it led me to eventually, uh, well, I guess not eventually, it was kind of crazy. I got involved with the world of autism at work, which of course now has become neurodiversity at work. 
but it started back in, you know, when I got involved 2015, 2016, it was all autism at work. And I, uh, through this crazy, crazy uh, scenario, you know, I think uh, uh, fate sometimes pushes us in the direction we're supposed to go, whether we want to or not. I, I got invited to the uh, SAP conference that was uh, being held in the USA. And at that point, anybody that was doing anything with autism at work was at the conference. And I think there was 150 of us or so. Uh, <laughs> there wasn't a lot going on at that point. And the funny part was, is uh, most people were just getting to know each other. Uh, you know, it wasn't the community it is now where lots of us know each other just over the years. And, you know, I was able to connect with and get to know a lot of the, you know, original movers and shakers, we'll say, in the autism at, at work community. And I don't know, one thing leads to another and I end up uh, lecturing a, a class session at uh, one of the Ivy League uh, universities here in, in the U.S., which to me was kind of a, a real kick. And actually, I did it five years in a row because uh, I'm actually a uh, one-year community college dropout. So I, I think the only thing worse is you could be a junior college dropout. Other than that, I think it's you know, as low as you can get as a community college dropout. And, you know, one thing led to another. And, you know, before I know it, I'm talking to major companies about neurodiversity and, and autism. And it's been, uh, we'll say, quite a uh, interesting ride along the way of, uh, you know, companies that I never, never in my life thought I would uh, be presenting to and, and talking to and getting paid by. I'm suddenly doing those things. And, you know, that kind of, uh, I don't know, it's been all consuming. It's still all consuming. And that kind of got me to here, you know, along the way, I uh, created a, a course that uh, is being taught through a uh, technical training company here in, in the U.S. Actually, they're global, uh, but they're based out of the U.S. Uh, you know, I've written a book, Geek's Guide to Interviews, 15 Critical Items for the Technical Type. And that was back before I was openly autistic. Uh, I, I knew I was autistic, but I, I didn't use those words yet. So geek was code word for autistic. Of course, we we know now that it's not just the technical types that you know have autism. Autism could show up in any career field and does show up in you know any career field. So I think that's kind of a you know main background. I uh, I do work in the technical world. Uh, I am a uh, technical trainer for one of the major global internet based companies, and um, again a role that often. People would assume autistic people can't do, uh, but I don't know. They seem to keep me around, so I, I guess I do okay. <laughs> and uh, you know, like I say, I've been a geek all my life. Done a lot of things, had lots of careers. Had a career in uh, uh, bicycling was my first thing, and had the opportunity there to do a fair amount of marketing and advertising. And then uh, owned my own manufacturing business for ten years and did more marketing and advertising. And the reason I bring that up is it really colors my approach to a lot of things because even though at the time I didn't understand this breakdown, this impedance mismatch or whatever you want to call it, I understood that in order to be effective with marketing and advertising, you had to talk to the wants and desires of the audience, even if it made no sense to you. Now it makes sense to me why uh, it's not, you know, my preferred processing style, but I now understand why. And I think that's been one of the challenges uh, the autism neurodiversity in general, but the autism community specifically has had is because they don't recognize things such as the sound of a word has a huge amount of meaning to it because to us, it doesn't have a huge amount of meaning. It has virtually no meaning. And we've done a bad job of being advertisers and marketers for ourselves. So, you know, we, we've uh, gone with this, uh, you know, that, oh gosh, you know, autistic individuals, there's only 15% employment, or they put it as 85% unemployment. And if you sit down and figure out those numbers, I think it's bull crap. <laughs> because, I, you know, in the tech industry I work in, if, if that's true, I think I work with every autistic person that's, that's employed. That's just... Well, <laughs> there's just not enough of them. <laughs> well, 
I, well, now, so, I'm not saying that there's not a a a uh, you know an underemployment challenge, hmm. but I think that, you just that don't think you know, it's 80%. <laughs> no, no. I mean, if you if you figure it down, and I, I finally took the trouble to do it. It's just always been yep. one of those things that got level. And I, I finally sat down and just took uh, and did it for the U.S. just because, you know, I'm in the U.S. Yep. And you know, you know us how Americans are. We're, we're all self-centered anyways. And um, it works out to be that one out of 23 companies employs a single autistic individual. Now, you know, in, well, it's like in most countries, you know, the majority of companies are small. I mean, you know, we hear about the huge ones, but the reality is there's way more small companies than huge ones. So the average is 5.3 employees per company if you just divide the number of employers by the workforce. So that still works out to be one autistic individual working per 120 workers. And that's not my experience in any industry I've ever worked in. It's definitely higher than that. Now, it's not where yeah. it should be. But but, you know, but it could also be your field. Um, so I, I was talking well, to Ubisoft, um, the games manufacturer. Well, um, they, they have a high high yes, percentage. Like 40%. <laughs> right. But I, I also, uh, you know, I, I owned a manufacturing company for 10 years. Uh, manufacturing is not known as being... You know, one of those areas particularly, and uh, I, I know I, I employed a couple autistic individuals. Now, looking back on it, I I know that I yeah. did. You know, at the time they were just uh, uh, quirky and uh, special. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Expect you know, eccentric, special, uh, extremely good, and uh, and I got along with that group. Uh, so, <laughs> but you know, and I said I worked in the bicycle industry. I did sales. I was a you know sales manager. I did national sales teams. Uh, so I, I've been in a lot of industries, and it just doesn't ring true. And and I think to me, where it breaks down is by going out and promoting that it's you know eighty five percent unemployment. You're, you're almost telling every employer that you don't hire anybody like me. Which now they're scared because they don't know what hiring somebody like me would be like. On the other hand, you know, if the employer has any size, you know, 50 people, you know, 20 people, 50 people, they probably do have an autistic individual working there already. And I think if you approach it from the standpoint of you already have people like me working for you, but you're not getting the value you should out of me because you, you know, aren't tapping into what unique perspectives and abilities I bring because you're treating me like everybody else and I'm not everybody else. So I, I just think it, uh, it almost creates a barrier because telling people to do something they've never done is harder than getting them to do something they've done that they didn't realize they've been doing anyways. Yeah, and, and and to support the people they've actually got. Um, well, that's definitely yeah. the place to start, which I think is <laughs> um, you know, that's it, different. You know, moving than, away from these you know um, new inclusive recruitment ideas because we want to increase the level of divergent group in our workforce. Yeah, but then when they get into the workforce, what are you doing with them? You know, you put right. them through the same processes, the same mill, the same hole in the t kid's toy to get you know the same cookie cutter outcome because if you yeah. are then you're going to get lots and lots of turnover and dropout because people are people and you should really be dealing with them on a person-centered basis not a cookie cutter process uh, exactly and i you know i i can't say that it was wrong i mean that that's where the industry started or the the you know i say industry when i say by industry yeah. what i really mean is the and at first it was <laughs> just autism yeah. at work and all the people around it, you know, supporting it, promoting it, consulting on it. You know, it all really started with Special Eastern out of, uh, I don't know, they're out of Denmark, aren't they? Netherlands, Denmark, I don't know, you know. To me, it's all the same. I know they're different. Sorry, you know, I hate, hate to insult you over there. Yeah, yeah, out of Europe, right? <laughs> and, you know, that was really the model. And uh, uh, Thorkel, you know, the, the owner of the, the organization, was the original consultant that taught everybody how to do this. And it was always focused originally as being a hiring program. You know, let's, let's figure out how we change how we interview. Let's change and teach the managers that they're going to deal with, at least initially, how to 
interact with these people. Let's build some supports around them. But there was a total ignoring of the ones that they already had. And of course, when it, it was just Special Eastern, Special Eastern was specifically hiring autistic individuals. So it was all autistic individuals. There wasn't anything else that made sense. But of course, one of the, the first big companies to join in was uh, SAP has been you know a huge leader in it. Well, SAP is, you know, it's massive. Uh, you know, they're, they're the biggest private software company in the world. And I think the figure is 88% of every transaction in the world goes through their software somewhere. You can't tell me that they don't have autistic individuals working for them. And, you know, they, they have, what, a couple hundred thousand employees? I don't know how many they have. They have lots of employees. But the focus has been just on only that group that they hired through the program and uh, good friends with the, the gentleman that ran that program for years. And now they've made him just the ambassador and sent him back to his real job again. And, uh, you know, he, he's the first one to admit that the program hasn't changed the company. In other words, anywhere else you go in the company outside of that program, I and mean, the program was good, it did good things, it opened doors, they ran conferences, they spread the word. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm not saying that they, it was all, it was negative, but they've been at it eight years now, nine years, something like that. And they're still not a neuro-inclusive company because it was always looked at as being just this hiring program with this group of individuals. And, 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 and then those individuals are masking to fit in with the um, culture and climate already, rather than bringing their own, own culture to the conversation to then develop the workplace organizational culture from the inside, because you have that difference of opinion, that difference of yeah. doing things. So, De definitely, definitely. And, and, you know, actually, when, when you mentioned masking, you know, that's another tirade I have. Um, I, I like to call them my, my, my soapbox issues. Uh, one of these days, uh, you know, I actually went on eBay one day looking for to buy a soapbox, you know, an old fashioned mm -hmm. wooden soapbox, because I don't know if it's a saying over, you know, for you, but here in the US, there's a saying, you know, you get on your soapbox, which I guess goes back to the ancient days, you put the soapbox down, you stood above the crowd. Now you could, you know, go on about whatever. And, and they were so friggin' expensive, but I, you know, I really would would like one, but I'm not willing to spend three hundred dollars for a soapbox. Uh. Yeah, but, but but then this is where you get like a, um, a a bushel for apples, and you write soap on the side instead of apples, and then <laughs> right. and then and then you've got it much cheaper because there's loads and loads of apple bushels. Yeah, but, but I, I I I know it's not a true soapbox. Then you know that's that's, that's the problem. But um, I think there there's a. I don't know how would how would I phrase it. Uh, too many things are defined as being masking. The, the reality is, everybody in the world, when you go into the workplace, well, maybe if you're working for you know a little company, a couple of people, you might be different. But you know, you get to a corporation size, you know, five hundred, a thousand, you know, bigger. Everybody, neurotypical, any particular you know piece of the neuro distinct you want to pick. Everybody is having to conform to a certain extent and not to be their true 100% pure themselves. Um, as uh, as uh, you know, my friend at SAP uh, says, one of his friends says, who is a neurotypical friend, um, I don't walk into the conference room and fart. I just know that's not something that's appropriate to do. So not everything in my mind is masking. There's a certain amount that is social interaction that you have to learn how to do but there also is masking which is pushing it to the point where it now becomes unhealthy and yeah you know no reflection of you but i think there's we over ascribe not being my pure true 100 percent myself as everything being masking but learning to say good morning to your co-workers isn't masking that's just you know the grease that yeah, makes the, the social world turn. <laughs> so, so, so there's, the, 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 there's definitely a scale of uh, learnt response and masking. Yes, I, I think I think it's on the same continuum. So, you know, I, I used to work for a workplace in sales, and every morning, I, you know, everybody when they arrived would go around and shake everybody's hand and say good morning to everyone. 
And then in my last job, I said good morning to somebody when they were free and within 18. Okay, so so that's a culture of the organization rather than me needing to conform to something. But you know, if I can't, you know, if you've got Tourette's and you're suppressing your tics because they're not socially accepted, then you're spending energy doing something that you might not need to do. I would class that as masking. I would agree with you 100% on that um, at that point. Now, so somebody with Tourette's who doesn't care about social norms and ticks and has um, outbursts all the time, maybe they're not masking because they've come to the conclusion that, well, I am me, and if people don't get me, then good luck. Yeah, that's Vegemite or Marmite. You don't like me, move on. There's 8 billion other people in the world that you could be friends with. Um, or um, something else, or, or their inability to mask, because actually what's going on for them overpowers their um, cognitive ability to be willing and conscious in the decisions that they make. You know, there's lots of challenge with neurodistinct uh, people about um, impulse control. You know, sometimes we do things that we didn't intend to do, but our brains thought of it and it, we did it before we even realized we, that we'd done it. And that might well, be. My brain intended to do it. Um, <laughs> I, I just, you know, if I had actually processed it, it might not have been a good decision, but. Uh... <laughs> well, but, but, but then sometimes speaking truth to power um, is the right thing to do. Um, but we've just done it without the tact needed for the recipient to hear it. Exactly, exactly. So, yeah, I think we really both agree that there is, a, you know, if you have Tourette's and you go and say good morning to people because that's the accepted social norm in, in the organization and you don't worry about suppressing your tics and, and your outbursts as you're saying good morning, that's just conforming to the, you know, the general expectations of the company. To me, that's not masking. Now, if you have to try and cover and, and suppress the ticks and the outbursts. Okay, now we've gone too far down the line and we've, you know, we're at the opposite end of the continuum. So I think we both agree that there's this, it, it's a sliding scale. Yeah, the, 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 there is a line that you can draw. Um, yes. You know, for, for, for the last 10 years, I've been working in HR consulting effectively um, with the mantra of bringing your whole self to your work. Because if you're thinking about something that isn't your job, then you're not doing your job as well as you could do your job. And a neurotypical might be worrying about their sick kid or their sick mother. And if they come into work and say, hey, I'm not going to be on my best form today because I'm worrying about all of this other stuff, then we can have some mutual understanding, some empathy, some compassion. And that person will give 100% of what they can give because they feel supported and cared for. If they come to work and give 40% because that's all they've got to give, and then we discipline them for not pulling their weight, then you're just going to drive that person out of the organization because you're not showing that you care. So it's about creating that psychological safety so employees can be open and say, these are my challenges, this is what I'm facing. And that needs to be faced with kindness and compassion um, so we can actually support people through stuff. And again, it's a continuum where you then and see people taking it too far. Oh, I need a duvet day because I just decided today I didn't feel like coming into work. I'm sorry, right. that's not real. Uh, now, you know, if you are depressive and you actually are in burnout and you can't physically get out of bed, well, then maybe the organization needs to support you. Um, but yeah, there's definitely um, a sense of entitlement with the youth of today. You know, I, I have a conversation. Uh, one, one of the people I collaborate with a lot is uh, Dr. Lutza Ireland out of Australia. And she and I uh, have had this conversation, you know, many, many times uh, dealing with, is it something that you need an accommodation for, or is it simply a desire or a wish of, for your the way you want to work? You know, mm -hmm. to say that I can't come to work till 11, but then I can only work till one and probably isn't true. That's probably what you would wish for your ideal schedule. Uh, so I, I think you're, you're right. You're, you're really, is, it's that line between 
Well, well, it's the reasonableness test. Yes, yes. So, it, so, it's so, re- yeah. Yes. In, in the UK, um, our Equality Act um, outlines reasonable adjustments support for marginalised groups and a whole heap of other stuff. Um, and the legislation has a statutory obligation for employers to make reasonable adjustments for those people who require support to fulfil their day-to-day activities at work. Mm-hmm. Okay. But what's reasonable? Well, you need to look at the circumstances and the context. You know, if yeah. that individual was suffering from chronic fatigue, was homebound, and they could only log on for three hours a day because that's all their energy could muster, well, then that might be reasonable. If they are a jock who plays on six sports teams, then he could probably come into the office. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. You know, that's a lot like uh, in America, so the ADA, the Americans with Disability Act is the same thing is uh, accommodations have to be reasonable. And of course, who gets to determine reasonable is the the company, the organization gets to determine reasonable. And it, it, it brings up a lot of different things. You know, one of the first things is, is as you say, what what is reasonable? And at least in the ADA, I don't know how it works with with your Equality Act, but with the ADA, you have to be able to do your primary job duties with whatever accommodations you're you're looking for. So if your primary job duty is X and you you want an accommodation to not do X, that that is not considered reasonable. That, That is your job. X is your job. Now, most of us have in our jobs, we have secondary duties that we have. And if you can't do one of the secondary duties, well, that's, you can do your primary duty. It's more reasonable. (laughs) Yes, yes. It's, you know, secondary duty is not, uh, you know, it's not unreasonable to say this is causing me a challenge and it's a secondary duty. I can still do my primary duty very well, but this one over here is causing me a problem. Uh, So, there's a lot of you have to split that. Is it your real job? And if it's your real job, the answer is, at least in the U.S., you have to be able to do your real job with the accommodation that you ask for. Yeah. And, 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 and that's where language trips over itself, especially in the U.K., between accommodations and adjustments. So a, a reasonable adjustment is a statutory obligation. But you can ask for adjustments or accommodations that aren't a reasonable adjustment so you could say um you know i've got four young kids i would like to work from half past nine till six because then i can do the morning school and i come to the office and you can grant me that accommodation without it being a reasonable adjustment because i don't need it for a specific reason related to my disability or difference i would just like the accommodation and that might be you know, can you send me an email after our meeting so I know that we, what we've talked about? Okay, well, that might not be a reasonable adjustment. That might just be an accommodation. Um, but some people like lists of information or to-do lists or whatever, written format stuff. Um, so somebody else who might really struggle with interacting with that data might have, after every meet, you know, before every meeting, you're going to send out an agenda at the meeting, we're going to follow the agenda. And after the meeting, you're going to send me an email with everything we talked about. That could be a reasonable adjustment because it might go beyond a informal request for accommodation. Um, but it's so common in this world where language means more than one thing. Um, I, I was at a session with uh, Judy Singer uh, back in mm-hmm. April talking about neurodiversity and, and, and the founding of autism and its cousins <laughs> and how autism and its cousins became neurodiversity. <laughs> well, um, that, that is, a, that is a, an interesting story by itself uh, because, uh, you know, everybody pellets back to you know, neurodiversity and what it is. But, you know, if you read Judy's paper, which is on the internet, if you haven't read it, you should go read her paper because it is the foundation. It's speaking purely about autism. It's, it's not speaking about you know, any of the other conditions. And, and I'm not saying we shouldn't be including them, but uh, it, it does kind of set a basis of what really is it or was it thought to be. And we've certainly expanded that now to a much broader range. 
Uh, it's a, but, it's an interesting read. It, it's a definitely you know it's, it's worth if somebody hasn't read it to. And, 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 it. <laughs> and, and, and the movement now is far more about the fact that we have eight billion people on the planet and eight billion different minds. So neurodiversity being, well, the movement's definition being um, the fact that we've got eight billion different minds. Okay, but then how do we define those people who are distinct or divergent or not typical? <laughs> and, 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 and what do we do there? So then I was speaking to um, Atif Chowdhury, who is the CEO of Diversity and Ability in the UK. So that's one of the UK's biggest consultancies for um, disability, access to work, neurodiversity stuff. Um, and he said, you know, uh, we're all neurodiverse, but not everyone is marginalized by it. Okay, so so I'm I'm not neurodiverse or neurodivergent. I'm neuromarginalized. Cool. <laughs> yeah, I, I kind of looked at it a, a, a different way. And yeah, what one thing is, of course, we've always talked about neurotypical, uh, which what what is typical, who knows, as being the largest you know, the majority of the population. Mm -hmm. And and I don't think that's true. If you just sit down and I, I again, use US sources just because, but you sure you could do it with UK sources or, you know, any other, you know, main, main country. And um, if you go and just add up the prevalence rates of the things that we call, you know, neurodistinct nowadays, you're over 50% of the population real fast, and you got a lot of lists still to go of, of conditions to go through. But now, that we, doesn't we include co occurring, does it? Right. I was going to say, we, we know there's co occurrence. <laughs> but still, if you add up and you get to 75% or 80% with co occurrence, I don't think you're going to get it down below 50% still. Wow. Um, but what, so what that's got me thinking is we really have a small group that controls the norms that we are supposed to follow. And those are the who we actually call neurotypical. And it's not, well, I don't think it's the largest group, but I think this is the important thing about them. They're the most cohesive group. Mm. They'll, they'll support a similar thought, a similar thought pattern. And it could include many conditions and people that we would say they are neurodistinct, but they'll buy into the, you yeah. know, that, that idea. It's the, uh, you know, the, the king uh, is wearing no clothes. Uh, well, most people will say, no, no, the king, it's the king. We're going to say king's got gorgeous clothes. Uh, but, you know, there's a few of us that will say, no, the king is naked. And, um, you know, the king should have some. And, and then we'll be fine. <laughs> well, they, they didn't have your head cut off back in those days, I think. Um, but uh, I really think it, it has more to do with the, the cohesiveness. Uh, you know, it's a lot like political parties. Is it the biggest political party that wins? And the answer is usually no. It's the one that can be the most cohesive and get the most people to, you know, move towards their side, even if they don't belong specifically well, to and, that group. And, and, and that's before we start looking at electoral reform and the college system or in the Well, UK. that's a different... You know, what, well, what well, 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 because, well, well, because the popular vote very rarely lines up with the actual outcome because first past the post doesn't exist. Well, we've, we've currently got first past the post rather than a populist vote. Um, so, you know, in the UK, we have districts and wards and then they roll up into the final outcome. Um, so it's similar but distinct to the US system. Um, so in my ward, um, there's something like 30,000 voters. Um, the predominant party has won every election since the 1950s by more votes than all of the other votes added together. <laughs> There's no point in me voting. <laughs> Um, well, that's at least in the U.S. Of course, we redraw those those maps because it, it does work the same, you know, the same way that uh, there are districts within the states, and then they roll up into the state level, and uh, that, that's what's called gerrymandering, right? When you go and uh, draw the lines and boundaries in such a way that uh, one party virtually could not lose, uh, you you you've just put 
so few of the people that uh, may believe differently into that voting yeah. block, which I guess would be a ward at, at, at your level, um, that the, the race is fixed. Yeah. And then you end up with a two party system, despite the fact that we've got like 20 political parties, but only two will ever rule. Um, and yeah, there's, there's a big mess there. So, so for me, going back to the neurodiversity typicality conversation um, is also looking at um, all traits and behaviors are on a spectrum. And some of us have meet the diagnostic threshold to then be labeled with something. So everybody has the ability to have extreme candor, <laughs> but some people are so extremely candorous and honest that they might be added to a diagnostic list of you might have these types of traits. Um, so if you took that guy's that everybody's traits and behaviors are on a spectrum and arbitrarily some white middle class middle aged doctors have <laughs> drawn a line in the sand and said, well, if anyone has got these traits and they're past this line, then yeah, they get the Asperger's or autism or dyslexia or ADHD label because we're all on this line, but these people are special because they're over the top. Um, so when you look at it that way, then you can definitely see how there are people um, in the typical populace that might otherwise be distinct if that line was 2% closer to the middle. <laughs> so, yeah, um, I, I think that there's there's... A couple of things. First off, I think a lot of people don't understand what a spectrum means. Mm. A lot of people think of spectrum as being a continuum. And that it makes sense. You know, we're, we're taking this because it's coming from the medical community. And in most medical things, you, you can put it on a continuum. You know, I have a really bad, nasty cold or I have a very mild cold. You know, and it's just a, a movement up or down the scale. And same, you know, I have stage four cancer. That's it's pretty bad on the, you know, severe end of the scale. I have stage one. Well, you know, there's probably a lot of hope depending upon the specific cancer. But a spectrum is not a continuum. A, a, a spectrum is really a, a vast number of continuums. Hmm. So in other words, when we take autism, for instance, you know, we, we, we all know it's the DSM is the, you know, the... Uh, official Bible you diagnose by the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Health Disorders. And, and I, I personally think that, uh, you know, the whole diagnosing these things are, are mostly uh, BS, to be honest with you, uh, which is really what you're saying. You know, if you just move the line a little bit, uh, if I go to a different therapist than the other one, I may or may not get a different, you know, I mean, it's because you start out with, you have a committee that argues for, you know, some amount of time. It seems to be about four or five years between editions. So they argue for a number of years over where they're going to put A, what are the particular aspects we consider, and where is the line on that aspect? So I think the first thing is that, you know, understanding a spectrum is, I like to say, and I, I don't know, somebody I'll look up what the name of the damn game is. Uh, did you have the game that uh, when you were growing up, it was a bunch of sticks that were all the same length, but they were different colors. And I don't remember how you played the game, but I think you dumped them down and I don't know what you did with them. I can't remember. Well, so, so we I, had a game called Pick Up Sticks. Pick Up Sticks, right, right. And, is that, and, is that and, the, really and, the official name? they were name? kind of like in a nest. And yeah, then yeah, you had to like down. pull them out and do something with them, but I can't remember because it was... Decades. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> I, I, but they're, they're a good illustration because pickup sticks, though, were all exactly the same length, but we had a variety of colors. And if we were to look at the color as being a particular trait, so we selected this trait. I am so glad you're measure. saying this. So, and I've and, been and working we, on um, yeah, a, a, a model for neurodivergent difference um, that is a color spectrum 3D model. Yeah, I, you, you can't, and that's because a You're spectrum, fine. you can't represent a spectrum on a line. A spectrum really is a, a three-dimensional, mm. uh, you know, it's a multi-dimensional model. Uh, it's, it's not, so I, I just say, if you take those pickup sticks and we just broke them into random lengths and, and we throw the pile down there and we each grab a handful, well, we're all going to have some mix of the same traits because there's only so many colors there to represent the different traits, but the length indicating the you know, the intensity of that trait that you have. Yeah. And 
we're just arbitrarily picking that if you have this combination at some particular length that stands out more than it does for another, then we call it X. Yeah. If we, as we know, there's there's no blood taps, there's no MRI, there's no anything to say that you have autism, that you have ADHD. I mean, we it, it's done purely by judgment. And somebody, you know, they they come out with a DSM and 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 some bunch of scholars sit down and they uh, come up with an assessment. And uh, it may be, uh, you know, a, a funny part is they're still not computer based. They're usually paper based still, um, which is a whole nother story. Yeah. And you go through and you you take this, you know, 300 question assessment and, and somebody arbitrarily decided, uh, A, what questions on there actually indicate what your, you know, propensity is in this particular trait. And somebody else, you know, or same group probably, uh, arbitrarily chose that if you get a certain number of score that you have something or you don't have something. Uh, or of course, there's the old fashioned way uh, where you simply go to your, uh, your psychiatrist and they talk to you and they go, hmm, you are autistic, uh, which is probably more accurate to be honest with you. <laughs> um, but I, either way, it really comes down to, as you say, if you just move the numbers a little bit. I mean, we know that if you take that assessment test and we give it to you a month later, you can come up with a different score. In well, one week, one month, and, you can be... And, and if you prepare, then you might get a different score. Exactly. Or you have a bad day. Uh, you know, you yeah. tripped over the dog. You dumped your coffee down the front of yourself. You, you know, it was just not... Or, or, or you're tranquil and serene and not stressed by anything. So then all of those mannerisms that you typically have day to day don't come across. And then they're like, well, you don't seem hyperactive. You don't seem. <laughs> so, no, well, that, that's once, because I'm, for I'm, once I'm really chilled out. <laughs> right. I, I'm chilled. Exactly. I, I, I took three Xanaxes before I came because I was really worked up and now I'm so chilled that I really just don't care. Uh, and, but I, I guess the, you know, just the point is, is as you say, it's so arbitrary. There's so many people. And, and I think that's, that's where we have another big failing is if you missed by two points on this scale that was a 300 uh, you know, question test, you do not get the diagnoses. But my question is, do you suffer any less than the person that had two more points? And my, my answer would be no. <laughs> you know, Two points out of 300, uh, chances are you're dealing with a lot of the exact same issues. Well, uh, so, so, so this is where the intersectional approach comes in, that actually you could score 300 from 300, um, but not be marginalized at all because, you've, could, because you're making up from it with other areas. So, you know, some of the most brilliant people on the planet are neurodistinct. I wouldn't say that they're marginalized or downtrodden or have suffered. They might have caused themselves to suffer by the actions that they choose. <laughs> well, I, I can think like, of, uh, like, you, you know, know, sleeping on the floor of a factory because you don't want the factory to fail. Um, uh, or but... <laughs> uh, or uh, sending out a message that cost you $200 million uh, because uh, you, you just broke a, uh, you know, a, a security uh, thing because you are the CEO and you shouldn't be saying those things publicly. Uh, or, or getting caught smoking pot on Joe Rogan's podcast. Or... <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Um, so, uh, but you know, has you know, has the you know Elon suffered from it? Um, and I guess would be yes. Uh, you know, is, is he the richest guy in the world now, or I don't know, maybe he's second richest today? It varies every day, you know, whether he's richest or not. But he's he's up there. You know, is he dealing with some of the same issues that the the rest of us who are out, you know, grubbing for a living, uh, are, are putting up with? And and the answer is. Uh, no, except for the ones he self-imposes for the most part. Or, 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 or yes, but he's found an accommodation to avoid. Yeah, well, the accommodation is own the company. And uh, when you go to HR, then uh, guess what? Uh, <laughs> so you can't fire me because yes, I sir, own what... you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir, what do you want? <laughs> yeah. um, but I, I would kind of guess just uh, when, when you look through some of his history and some of what he's done and some of the challenges he's faced, relationships have been a problem for him. And, uh, you know, relationships are often a problem for autistics. Um, you know, I've luckily been married 38 years. Uh, they haven't been all smooth sailing, but uh, we've, we've managed to, you know, work, work our way through. Well, a, a calm sea never made a good sailor. <laughs> Isn't that the truth, though? Um, 
So I, I think, uh, you know, even though he has certainly achieved greatly, I don't think it's been without any suffering. Without harm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you read about, you know, some about him as a kid and stuff. He certainly you know, got, got beat up and, uh, and bullied like uh, most of us autistics probably got beat up and bullied in school. So, but so two very quick bits. Um, feel free to look up um, Munsell color theory. So it's like the color wheel, but in 3D, M U N S E W -L, L. Um, and that's a three dimensional color theory based on hue, saturation, and brightness, essentially. Um, and I think what we're saying is actually spectrums can be multi dimensional, but because we're used to seeing things in 2D and 3D. Anything more than 3D, we just can't comprehend. Um, right. So maybe um, that's part of the challenge is for us to say, well, you know, if you can move in four dimensions or 12, um, then it gets a little bit too scary. Um, so that's the first. The, the second is, um, is, is, there, is there a benefit for having a like a scale of wounding. So actually we, we throw difference out of the window and we only look at outcomes and then we measure harm based on outcome. And then we only give support to those people who have met a threshold of harm. So you might have neurotypical people in poverty or in bad political systems that are starving. They might deserve, deserves a bad, I'll use it because I haven't got a better word. They might deserve more care, compassion, and support than um, a middle-aged, middle-class man with autism who's managed to work for 40 years and still has a job, but has challenges with pissing people off because he's too blunt or something, something, something. But society... I think I've been there once or twice. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, because then you get into the situation where there are some, you know, two very similar people um, who are experiencing reality and life very differently because of one change in their intersection. Now, does that mean that either of them deserve more or less support is kind of the track of the conversation that I was walking down? Well, I think the answer really is, is... Uh... You know, first off, you know, all, all humans, regardless of, you know, fill in any particular way we want to slice them and dice them, you know, deserve, you know, respect and dignity just because they're a human. And I think we, we have to start from there. Now, if somebody is having challenges in, in, and again, because of, you know, who knows, you described a couple of reasons, there's, you know, far more reasons why they could be having challenges. You know, do they deserve some type of help or support? Uh, you know, I think you really have to say it, it's somewhat conditional upon what is the norm in the area they're in. You know, if, if we take somebody that is in a uh, very underdeveloped third world country dictatorship, do they deserve uh, help and support above and beyond everybody else that's suffering under the same third world dictatorship? I, I don't know. I mean, that, yeah, I guess yeah, on one hand you could say yes, but really the problem is, is uh, you know, it's a bad political system that's causing bad economic problems. It's causing everybody to suffer. So I, I don't know if, if really just looking at, at outcomes, you know, what, what if I, you know, I'm having the the issues, even though I've been given, you know, the most appropriate uh, methodology to solve it, you know, mentoring, therapy, drugs, you know, whatever the appropriate things are. And and I just don't want to do it. I'm, I just, you know, uh, this is the autistic thing, really. Uh, I, I don't know how many autistics I've uh, I, I've talked to and um, you you tell them, you know, here, here's the key that's going to make the difference from everything you've told me you have. And the answer is, I'm not going to do it. Well, do they deserve now more support and help in spite of their own resistance to 
Well, you, I, you, I, 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 and we I, see I don't that. know. I mean, I, I'm just, I'm kind of throwing it out. I, I, I don't, hmm. well, I, so, I don't so, know, but there is that they, you know, they were given some support. For, for instance, uh, if we just take interviewing, I am, I am convinced that um, first off, you know, do, does should the interview process work the way it works? And the answer, I think, we all have to say is no. It's it's not an effective system, but it is the system that was in place in virtually every place in the world. So, and, and that's not because Britain ruled the world. And no, 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 we, we, no. It's a uh, you know, we, but we it's highly likely to be. But carry on. <laughs> <laughs> You know, we, we could go to areas where uh, Britain uh, didn't and then, you know, Spain or, or some other country happened to be the uh, colonial power at the time. And uh, th they still work the same way. Well, so, so I, I think it's actually down to reputation. So actually, historically, you would have a character reference and your reputation was your life. So you would be asked by a previous employer, yeah, is this guy any good? And if the answer was no, then he didn't get the job. Um, right, but that uh, that's gone out the window. I don't know how long ago with the industrial revolution and I don't know. You well, know, we huge still, corporations. We still have references, don't we? Yes, we we have references, <laughs> but we also uh, know that uh, unless you're you're talking to somebody who's from a very small company that really uh, doesn't care, and I mean doesn't care from the standpoint that they don't care if they get sued or not because they just don't care. They're they're just going to be honest because that's who they are. But if you call for a reference to most company, you know, most corporations, you, you are not going to actually get a true reference or not. You're going to get they worked here from here to here, and that's about what you're going to get. Uh, so, so you don't get a, a reference like you know, once upon a time. Yes, I mean, things were, were more village based and you go to the person they worked for and the person would honestly tell you a story because they weren't afraid that there was, you know, a bunch of lawyers to sue them because they you know, negatively affected your potential employment possibilities. So, you know, you go sue them. Um, so we have the interview system that we have right now. And, you know, the interview system we have and, uh, you know, yes, they check the references more than anything now just to say, did they actually work there? Because they know that they're going to get very little else besides, you know, verification that they did actually have employment at the place. So really what we do is we sit down, whether it's one-on-one -on -one with multiple people or, you know, it's a panel to one or whatever the format is. And, you know, I would have my preferences, which would be one-on-ones, and I'd rather have multiple one-on-ones than one on a panel. Uh, one on a panel is challenging, I think, for even neurotypicals. Uh, it's, it's just hard. But it comes down to they ask you all these questions, but the reality is there's this thing called human nature. And human nature, uh, you know, is kind of cooked into us from uh, evolution. Uh, it, it's what made humans become, you know, who we are these days. And I'm convinced one piece of human nature is, are you one of us? You know, are you safe? Can I trust you because you're one of us or are you one of them? In is which this a I good can't? culture fit? You got it. Bingo. <laughs> so it, it comes down to what, what's a good culture fit? I like you and you think like I do. And really, the think like I do, I think, has less. It has more to do with, do I like you? If I like you, I'm going to accept you and I'm going to overlook a number of other factors if I feel an affinity towards you. I am convinced you can create an affinity, people having an affinity towards you in an interview if you want to. You know, we, we have a whole industry, it's called acting, and it's all about making you feel certain ways. And you don't have to do it through the whole interview. That's the big thing is there's, what's everybody say about, uh, you know, interactions? First impression, you know, you only have one chance to make a first impression, right? So when you first meet the people, you know, there's, there's four or five minutes, maybe it's three minutes. You know, that first when you walk in the interview room or if you're doing it virtually when they first come up on the screen, the, the whole goal has to be to make these people like me. And, and a lot of people will say, well, you know, I can't do that. And that's that's masking and that's, you know, you know whatever, whatever, whatever. And, and my answer is, do you want a job? <laughs> and, and if you want a job, then in most companies, you need to create that connection. 
But the wonderful part is, is they're asking you no, no hard questions at that point. So you can put a lot of concentration into coming across in a likable, affable kind of manner, because they're not asking you challenging questions yet. They're asking you, you know, how was your drive over to sit down with us? Uh, so it's it's things that don't take much cognitive challenge. So you can be concentrating on how can I build a rapport? How can I build a warmth with these people? So I, I put up a LinkedIn poll um, a couple of months ago on that question. Um, and the question was, is masking in an interview deceitful? No, everybody does it. Right. It, it, does, it, it doesn't so, so matter six, whether they're neurotypical 60%, or not. 60% said no. Of those people who said yes, nearly all of them worked in HR. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, just, you're part of the problem, guys. <laughs> You know, I, I would love to see a, a recording of one of them being interviewed, and I'll guarantee you that they are. They uh, yeah. <laughs> but so I, I think you need to do it right in the beginning, because first impressions are the most important. Then the other place is at, right at the tail end, when they say, do you have any questions? And you're doing the, the wrap up. Because last impressions are lasting impressions. And when I when I did Geek's Guide to Interview, I, uh, long story why I did it, but uh, I had access to a lot of recruiters and HR people and hiring managers because I've been fired a lot. So I just went back to the ones that had hired me, then fired me and said, hey, would you let me interview you for this book? Um, which I guess, you know, I found out most people don't go ask people that fired them if they'd help them with something else. But, you know, they were nice people. They, you know, it was misunderstandings, you know, they so one, one question that I asked everybody, and sometimes I'd phrase it a tiny bit different, but the, the gist of the question was, you have a person that is 100% qualified for the role. It absolutely has every qualification you need, but they didn't get the offer. What did they do that made them not get the offer? Yeah. And the answer blew me away. And this is so easy to fix is the worst part. The answer was they didn't show enough interest in the role in the company. So how easy is it when you walk in to just concentrate on being friendly? And if you don't know how to be friendly, good. We'll teach you how to be friendly. It's not very hard to come off as friendly if you're not having to solve problems while you're doing it at the same time. And at the end... When they say, you know, are there any other questions or whatever, you know, make sure you have some questions. You know, obviously you write those down ahead of time. You should all relevant. Ahead of time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. I mean, so you have five questions and you eliminated two because they got covered already, but you at least have, you know, a question or two left that you can ask. And, and don't ask what they're going to pay you. That's a wrong time to do it. But um, but that's also the time to say this role in, in this company is just amazing. I, I, I would love to work here. Matter of fact, can I start today? Right? How hard is it to say that? I mean, you're, you're not trying to answer a question. The, well, the, the whole ball was in but your then, court. But then I point. got the feedback. Oh, he seemed too desperate. Well, I, I don't know. Go, going from... Uh, <laughs> I, I think desperate to me comes off across differently. Being excited about the role is different than being desperate, which well, is no matter how good what they say. You are. Well, I, I think I think being desperate is no matter what they say, uh, you, you know, everything is perfect. You now, saying I, I love the role and the job. Um, and it's minimum wage agreeing... as a trash disposal operative. <laughs> then, yeah. Well, you know, I, I don't know. Have you ever seen what some of these tra what trash disposal people actually make? It's like, holy shit, you know, that's. Mm, yeah, not a lot in the UK because they're all owned by councils. All oh, owned okay. Owned. Well, yeah. they, they need to come over. <laughs> come on over. Matter of fact, we're going to make it hard for you to get here, but uh, just come through the South America and, and you can walk right in and we'll give you a free cell phone. Um... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's. <laughs> <laughs> Well, at the moment, we're putting um, illegal migrants up in four-star hotels at the cost of same, same, know, the, six uh, million a day or something stupid. It's ridiculous. Same, <laughs> same. Um, the the uh, the army and navy, you know, have you know, here in the U.S. There's a uh, naval academy and there's the uh, the army um, academy, 
And the big football rivalry in collegiate football is Army plays Navy. You know, that's just a, a biggie. And a, a lot of people that were going to go to the game got uh, got their rooms canceled because they filled them with illegal aliens. So, you know, it, it's like uh, that didn't go over real big. <laughs> well, so, so, so one of the biggest controversies for us at the moment is that uh, we've got a uh, portable barge that um, was used for um, oil rig workers to like live on for the oil rig. Hmm. Um, and after the Falklands conflict, we had one of these barges in the Falklands where the army lived on while we were building uh, Mount Pleasant, the new airbase down on the Falklands. Um, so we've refurbished it for the migrants and they refused to live in there because of the standard of living. I was like, okay, so it's good enough for oil rig workers and it's good enough for our military but it's not good enough for a migrant who came over on a boat illegally. How, how does that? How does that work? Um, well, maybe we uh, should have. You know, uh, um, apparently, they wanted to leave their country. Of... <laughs> you know, apparently they wanted to leave their country and, and come here because in their country they were living in in much better digs and and being taken care of better, right? I mean, <laughs> you know, what what irks a lot of people in the UK is. Um, under the refugee rights stuff, um, loads of people come to the UK have travelled through safe countries. Mm. So surely if you're fleeing home, you want to stay relatively close to home because when it's not bad, you might want to go home. So that's why with Ukraine, we've seen loads of people in Moldova and Poland, Ukrainians staying close so they can easily get back. Right. Right. But when you when you're traveling from North Africa, you've come through five or six European countries, and then decide to sit on a boat for eighteen hours to cross the busiest shipping lane in the world to, to come to the UK. It does beg the question whether or not it was safer in France than crossing the Channel to come here. And you know, <laughs> I, you know I think we've lost. Um. I think it's less than 100 lives have been lost this year with people trying to get over from France to England. Mm -hmm. um, but something like 50,000 people have made that journey. So actually, it's quite a safe mode of transport if you work the numbers out. But France, France is pretty shit if you've got people willing to risk their lives to leave France. <laughs> I, th I always thought France was quite a nice place. <laughs> you know I, I i i shouldn't say it but i'll say it anyways um you know france would be really nice if it wasn't for the french you know well <laughs> I, I, I'm I, actually, I have i have some good friends that are french i'm just saying that in jest uh, well, <laughs> but, you know, uh <laughs> you know, britain is full of people who still believe that france are cheese eating surrender monkeys. um but um my ancestry is french so um, we were clever enough to come to Britain before William the Conqueror, and then we fought for the Britons against William and then got overthrown because William was better. Um, great. And then we were peasant farmers until, I don't know, 1940. Um, and then we got a profession. <laughs> <laughs> You know, that just when you say peasant farmers, this is just what pops into my mind, is um, did peasant farmers know that they were bad off? I think it depends I, on who, who you were working for. So um, historically in the UK, um, tenant farmers um, were essentially slave labor, as peasant farmers had their own ground. Um, and made a living off of their land. So, um, you know, I, I grew up in a house on two acres, and that two acres had pigsties and had chickens. So, you know, the family could survive based on the two acres of land that we had. Um, but, you know, that all of these big stately homes and home farms, which is the farm next door to the home owned by the manor, uh, with people working in there for a roof over their head and some gruel um is is a pretty sorry place to live 
I, anyway, it just makes me it, it makes me wonder that uh, you, you take now with you know modern communication and internet and TikTok and uh, you know all these things, and, and we have a whole generation that thinks everybody should be driving uh, Ferraris and Lamborghinis and uh, staying in uh, you know two thousand uh, dollar a pound or you know whichever value we want to put on it uh, hotels uh, every night and going on on luxurious vacations and because that's what they see. So, uh, yeah, I'm just thinking, you know, I'm, 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 you know, I'm older. I'm, I'm 63 now. I'll be 64 this year, end of the year. And, uh, you know, when I, when I had my first job, it would have been late 70s, and, and you had the newspaper. Uh, I mean, I, I think I was, I was treated well at the job. It was a, a family-owned store. I think they, they treated me well. But I, I had no basis of comparison, basically, other than talking to my, you know, friends uh, who worked at other, you know, local organizations. Uh, so I don't know, that just, you know, popped in my mind is, uh, you know, back when there was uh, virtually no communication going on, uh, did you actually know you were bad off? I, you know, I know I... Well, and and, and the comparison is always um, sideways and up. It's ne it's very rarely sideways and down. So um, I was listening to a clinical psychologist, I can't remember who it was, and that he had done some consulting with the UN on um, hunger and poverty and climate change and stuff. And it's like, well, 150 years ago, the vast majority of the world were living on comparatively a dollar a day today. Mm -hmm. Now, you couldn't live on a dollar a day today in a first world country because we have electricity and food that's shipped halfway across the world and and, and cell phones and, and my, and my that, internet bills more yeah. than that yeah <laughs> absolutely um, and, and then you realize that since 95 or 2000 we've halved the number of people living below that poverty line so when you think of those people who are living in homes made of stone or mud literally burning whatever they can find to heat up some rice to eat to them, that's their existence and their comparator is the woman next door doing the same thing. So they're not necessarily upset with their lot because that's just their existence and their comparator. But we've got people today living on benefits, food stamps, with a higher quality of living than people working 100 hour weeks in deprived third world countries complaining that they're not going to get a holiday. So just... <laughs> <laughs> Who are you comparing yourself to? Right. I, I know <laughs> when I was, I, I think it was sixth grade. So th this goes back, you know, sixth grade uh, would have been uh, like 69, 70, you know, 1969, 1970. And a social studies project we had to do was to interview somebody older. And I interviewed my father and uh, recorded it on a cassette tape. And, you know, I, the, the kind of funny miracle is a miracle. My mother had the tape still. And uh, uh, she was out visiting me in 2015. And so she mentioned she had the tape. And well, she said, it's all messed up. And I don't know, you know, for work or, you know, whatever. And I said, well, just send it to me. And uh, I got it. And uh, <laughs> I did nothing with it for about two or three years because, Thinking it might possibly be readable was better than knowing there was nothing there. <laughs> you know, there, there's something quirk of human nature in that part. But, uh, well, but it was Schrodinger's cassette. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So uh, the recordings I, there I and not there at the same time. <laughs> I, I was, uh, I, I was going to, uh, um, I don't know, for the, whatever was motivated. I, th I think it was actually I was going to go see my mother, and she was dying with cancer, and you know, so I decided I was going to see if this thing actually worked. If I could get a recording and bring it because it was the only recording we had of our father speaking you know and all and um so i i, I went to uh, amazon and uh you know paid way too much money for uh, a pair of cassettes that had screws to take them apart not you know the welded cases and i uh you know moved the tapes all back and forth and you know put them on new reels and put them in new shells and everything and, and it played it actually by, by all you know, all reason that should not have, it should have been a dead. I mean, it should have been demagnetized by then, but it played perfectly. Um, so one of the things that I had asked him, because I couldn't remember any of the things I asked him, you know, it was like 10 minute interview, um, was what did you do for fun? 
right? Because, uh, you know, 90% of, of what we do now is all about having fun. And so I said, what did you do with fun for fun as a kid? And his answer was, we didn't have fun. We worked. And, and it wasn't like he felt like he lost out on anything. That was just the norms. They were, his father was a direct immigrant from, uh, I, don't know, I say Russia, I think it was Georgia. I'm really not sure exactly, you know, the, the region, but, you know, generically Russia. And um, his mother was a first generation American with family coming from somewhere in, again, generically Russia. Uh, and they, they were farmers and uh, they weren't, you know, like making a fortune and, and doing super well. And, and you know, they, they work, they'd go to school and you come home from school and you'd work. And uh, it just made me really think about, um, it wasn't like he was saying, oh, we didn't have fun, we, we worked. And it wasn't as if he was saying it as if, oh, poor me, you know, I didn't get to enjoy. It was simply that's just that that was life for everybody. There was nothing wrong with it. That was just the way it is. And, I, you know, I guess when I, I relate that over to, you know, dealing with with autism and the autistics. I think that we run into a problem of uh, the uh, the autistic rigidity of mind of. I don't care if that's the way it is. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Even though they are capable and, and could do it without masking to a level that it's, I, I would put it more on the accommodating uh, social norms level, not on the masking side of the, the continuum. You know, not that it would take that much effort. So I don't, I don't, don't know where it fits in, but uh, just one of those, uh, those crazy no, things. Of, no, it, it, it's, I was listening to uh, Douglas Murray um, this last week um, talking about um, how people are work shy now. And if you look at every successful person, they're all workaholics. Yeah. <laughs> so, so maybe being a workaholic isn't necessarily a bad thing. Now, you know, uh, if, uh, yeah, I've been, uh, I've been if accused. it's destroying your relationships, then, well, that might be a bad thing, but. You know. I've been accused, and yes, it was uh, detrimental, uh, you know, for our relationship. And I, I did have to, you know, make a make a few changes. Um, you know, running a, a company full time and having a full time career in IT was um, uh, one of the things I did have to make a change on. Um, that that was becoming detrimental. <laughs> uh, but but you're right when, when you look at people that have been successful on on their own. You know, on their own terms, not uh, not somebody who you know inherited old money. Um, yeah, yeah. There's usually a lot of work in uh, in in that trail. Maybe they're not working that hard now, but when you look at, but, what but at some point there, they did do the hundred hour weeks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and uh, th that's where actually being autistic is a good thing, because if your dream and, and your special interest is tied up into that thing, a hundred hour week is an easy thing to do. So autistics, you know, get into doing something <laughs> and build your own business. <laughs> well, but it, it, it goes back to that Japanese Ikagi. It's okay, well, I've got something I'm really good at. Does the world need it? Am I going to get paid to do it? <laughs> well, I, I guess, yeah, that's the other thing is uh, you, you have to uh, check that what you're going to do can be uh, monetized in some manner. Um, you know, that's why we, I think, have the image of the, the starving artist. Uh, you know, the art is wonderful. These people are, are, you know, amazingly gifted and talented. But I don't have to go buy art to get by in the world today. Well, especially when you've got um, copyright infringement and AI. <laughs> right, all over the place. And, yeah. And, you know, it, it kind of diminishes and devalues art. Uh, okay, so Tim, um, how would you define the difference between a geek and a nerd? Well, I, I, I think uh, a nerd to me has some negative connotation wrapped around it. Okay. Uh, of um, being uh, uh, quirky, you know, maybe reserved. Actually, it has a lot of definition around it that looks like autism, probably. Um, 
Whereas a uh, geek is uh, simply somebody who is lives in the technical side of the world, but doesn't mean that they can't interact uh, with the rest of the world, but they definitely are going to look at things from, you know, I, I like to think of it uh, from, from, again, the marketing standpoint. Most of the world, if we were, you know, selling them this, uh, this pencil, um, you know, we, we would say things about, uh, you know, the, the color is so bright that it stands out and makes you look good. And it feels good when you write on it because, you know, the super processing we do on the, the graphite. And so we would sell it on emotional terms. Um, the, the geek and the nerd, both, you would have to sell it to them on the uh, on the technical terms of uh, it, it has two micron ground, uh, you know, graphite. And we're not even going to talk about what it feels like to use it because that doesn't matter to them. It's the you know, when you look at computers, right? How do we sell computers to a lot of the world? It's got so many gigahertz of processor speed, next number of cores, and so much memory, and you know, yada yada yada. Well, well, and, well uh, or, or you end up with that dichotomy of well, the home PC is you can watch HD movies, and then active well, gaming PC is yeah, you've got these quad cores with this RAM and and and. <laughs> right, right. So to, to me, the, the geek or the nerd would both be going for the it's the this and it's got the this and the this and the, even if it's a home media computer, it would still be the, you know, the, the whatever. But the, uh, the the nerd is uh, is less socially interactive in, in my mind, whereas the geek is somebody who's into the technology. So they're, you know, they're a geek. Um as opposed to uh, you know, I guess the other side of the world would be uh, you know, my Apple. Um, you know, I, I love my Apple and I have no clue what processor chips in it. I actually, I, I probably remember the memory because I bought it, but, uh, you know, I know what I like about my Apple. I turn it on and it works every time and it's just beautiful to touch and hold, hold. I love my Apple. Um, so I, I'm, I'm trying to be post geek and, you know, sound move. like feeling statements, Tim. <laughs> I, I know, I, I, you know, but it, it made me recognize that, uh, and I used to be a PC fan and, and it, it was actually so bad. Um, my, my daughter still has problems over this one, but, uh, this one go back to like 2009, somewhere around then. When did iPads come out? I don't know. Like, well, so, like, so the first iPhone was 2007. So iPads would have been like 2009, 2010, somewhere around there, right? Three or three or there a few years later, she wanted an iPad for Christmas. And, um, I, I said, if, if you get an Apple device, you're going to have to sit on the lawn to use it. <laughs> Uh, okay, I, I do still own a couple of PCs, and I use them for uh, doing technical three D. No, no, but, but and... is this where you bought a Microsoft Surface, thinking it was as good as an iPad? No, no, I, I own <laughs> I, I own I don't know how many Apples. I, I you know I own iPads. I own uh, an iPhone. I, uh, we're we're on a Mac right now, uh, which is a different Mac than the one I normally use upstairs, which is a different one that I use in the car. You know, I, I, no, I, I I own all Apples. Um, but I do have a few PCs just because there's some uh, engineering programs that I do for uh, 3D, uh, 3D drawing and things like that for you know, 3D printing and cutting stuff on the laser, stuff like that. Uh, so I guess I am a geek because I do have a 3D printer at home. And yes, I do have a CO2 laser at home. And I also have a, you know, a diode laser. And So, so, you know. so some, my, my definition between the two is um, a geek is somebody who's passionate about something and a nerd is an expert in something. So, mm. so a geek could admire Star Trek and Star Wars, but a nerd would be able to speak clean. <laughs> no, see, I, I never made that definition. To me, it was always more their uh, their um, social capability. Yeah, their, their their social interaction capability. They they both have a, a technical bend. Mm. Um, I, I guess uh, you know, putting it into the uh, speaking Klingon. Uh, uh, a geek could speak Klingon, but knows to not to in most situations. The nerd would just do it anywhere. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, I accept your definition. <laughs> well, I don't know if either one's right or wrong, but uh, you know, it, it, it's kind of interesting to... Uh... Well, th there is. I, I guess it comes down to it. It's just interesting the standpoint that words do have finesse in their meaning there's nuance in the meaning of words and in this case we're talking about words where the nuance in the meaning has has nothing to do with the sound of the word mm. but in lots of words the nuance in the meaning has to do with the sound of the word itself especially non-english languages 
Yeah, well, even in English languages, uh, if you look at uh, the drug industry, hmm. how much money do these freaking companies spend to come up with this whatever name is for the the lotion potion you know magic pill? Because that's not really the name, because the name is some big long you know medical compound scientific chemist you know yeah term. But th there's a fortune spent to come up with the the name that. Uh, well, you know, a benzodiazepine that's used, you know, for uh, for um, anxiety. Uh, yeah, but is... have you tried to say I be proof? It's hard. Just give me right, Nurofen. Right. <laughs> right, right, but the the thing is, is there there was thought that went into why that specific word. Yes, a they needed an easier word. I agree, um, but you take you know benzodiazepine versus Xanax, right? Uh, you know the. the you know, Xanax is just a specific benzodiazepine. Why did they pick the word Xanax? They, they tested it with a, like, I don't know, who knows how many people with a lot of other words and, and so people. Does just, this word sound calming? Xanax. Yeah, does it, exactly. Does it sound <laughs> yes. calming? Does it, does it sound something like, you know, does it sound safe? Does it sound calming? Does it sound relaxing? Does it sound. And I think that's where, as autistics particularly um, because there are a lot of other neurodistincts that are very good at those nuances uh you know adhd tends to be very emotionally driven they, they pick up those emotional nuances tends you know tend to i mean everybody's an individual of course uh and you know it, it varies but uh um, you know we, we uh, as autistics uh, as a whole don't tend to pick up on those nuances and th that's actually where you know, I use the term neurodistinct as opposed to the term neurodivergent. And, and that's simply that neurodivergent's got too damn many syllables. Uh, it, you know, I can barely spell it. Um, it. It's a PhD level word. We're all taught that we should be communicating on more of a fifth to sixth grade level for general communication. And to me, it has a... a a sound connotation, divergent, diverging, separation. It's, it's kind of deviant. Yes. I mean, there's another, you know, well, how, how can you have a good word that is based on a root of separation and deviation? Um, so. No, but then you could say that with the disses, with the dyslexia, dyspraxia, dyscalculia. Right, right. Which, <laughs> see, that, that's easy to say, though, because those are medical terms. And in the medical community, that to them, they are different because the medical community looks at things that way. So I'm not going to put down the medical community when I, you know, break an arm or something like that. I'm, I'm glad that they're into healing and fixing. Um, that, that makes me feel good. But on the other hand, I'm not going to let them determine who I am as a human by their view only. Uh, so I, I came up with the, the neuro distinct because I think most people want to be distinct in their life in some way, you know, family, their career, their hobby, and in, in something. And I, I could I, this is just what kind of played through my mind as I, I was coming through it. I couldn't imagine being a uh, you know psychiatrist, psychologist, uh, pediatrician, whatever, and telling parents that your your kid is neurodivergent. Versus your kid's neurodistinct. It's like, oh, cool. I've always wanted a kid that was distinct. <laughs> uh, versus Just not too know, distinct. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Not too distinct, though. Uh, <laughs> being distinct is a good thing. Um, I, I think some people give up on being distinct too early or they take it too extreme. There, there's a, you know, there's, the, there's a, <laughs> well, the, the, a line there's, there. There's definitely something about finding yourself and being yourself, enabling you to find others who accept you for yourself. Um, but that doesn't mean that you have to turn it up to a level. But then some people's five is already at eight. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right, right. Uh, yes, it, it could be that the attribute is not a negative attribute. The problem is the volume's too high. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, and and that's what I'm doing with um, the Mantle's theory is is looking at um, traits being color based, 
um, and um, saturation being the scale of one to ten, but then the um, brightness or the white to black shift um, being um, impact. So is this trait an eight? And is it positively impacting your life or negatively impacting your life? Because you could have two identical people with identical traits doing an action but getting two different results. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, just another one of those. Yeah, it, it's kind of interesting. I, I um, kind of came to the conclusion, like you did, that uh, uh, this is multi-dimensional. You can't you can't put it on a a single plot. You can't just say that it's, you know, you're, you're a seven. Um, there, there's too many variables involved. If you, if you took all the variables and condensed it down to a seven, I now know absolutely nothing because you condensed way too much stuff down into one, one data point. Yeah. Or, or, or you end up with 3000 data points and a seven is a seven on one line of those 3000 points. Right. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I, I like you came to the, the conclusion. It's essentially three dimensional. So, I reached out to the uh, the two people I know that are probably the the best geniuses in three d dimensional stuff. And uh, one one was the guy that uh, invented the software that became Maya. Um, figured he knows a thing or two about three d. And uh, the the other person was the uh, gentleman that started uh, EA entertainment arts. Um, you know, so first game, you know, major gaming company. <laughs> There's a thing or two about uh, uh, about it, so I asked both of them. Um, you know, how would you do? How would you really express this in three D? And and their answer was so funny. This was the answer from both of them, and they weren't. I mean, I asked them separately. I didn't ask them together. Their answer was, "Don't do it in three D. It's too damn complex. Make it simpler." <laughs> yeah. Well, we can't. <laughs> well, I, I did come up, I think, with simpler and. Um, I came up with what I refer to as uh, interactional indicators, which is you, you have to pick a certain number of points that matter because there are an infinite number of points and some of them really don't matter. Yeah. And I, I then plotted them on uh, on radar charts and put them into three separate radar charts, one dealing with socially oriented things, one dealing with communication oriented things, and one I just call traits, which just deals with it doesn't fit in social, it doesn't fit in communication, but it fits somewhere. And by putting them on, you know, spider or radar charts, whichever you you prefer, you, you really have that idea that you're expressing a multi-dimensional kind of thing without putting it into a, a 3D space that is hard for people to so, so uh, you've got overlapping shapes that would make a 3D object if you overlaid them. But yes. As a MRI brain slice it's easier to compute because you've only got the two dimensions of the two axes of right. So, right. If we look at uh, communication, you know, for instance, there is, how is your outbound communication one-on-one? How is your outbound communication one-on-many? Uh, how is your, uh, you know, communication in expressing emotion? How is your communication inbound one-on-one? How's your communication inbound many-on-one? How's your inbound ability to process uh, emotion? Uh, so, you know, a number of things that are dealing with, are you likely to get a, a realistic uh, view of what the other person's saying, or do you have holes? And of course, you know, as, as we all know, uh, the, the neurodistinct, doesn't matter which one you have, tend to have spiky profiles, which means there's real strengths, but there's real weaknesses with them. Neurotypicals, and I've used this with with both, and it is interesting. Neurotypicals are the highs and lows are much closer together. I mean, there is variation, but it's not as extreme. Uh, but when you go into uh, uh, neurodistinct, the variation gets more extreme. And what areas are more extreme depends upon which neurodistinct you know category we're we're looking at. And uh, it's interesting. I actually use it in my presentations a lot of uh, showing a continuum with a big X through it that this is not how neurodistinct things work because it just doesn't work this way. And underneath it, throwing the the spider charts. And then I just talk through my own personal one because at this point, it's about 10 minutes into a presentation. And I just say, I, I think you can 
figured out by now. I can string a few words together and communicate at some level. But what you don't know is I do not pick up emotion. <laughs> Coming back, I stink. It's horrible. I'm terrible. <laughs> uh, and I think that's one problem that people have is they assume that if you can communicate well on an outbound basis, that your inbound communication abilities and your deciphering the communication is equally strong. And that's the, the interesting part of when we look at it as multidimensional is no, these dimensions are not linked to each other. You can be very strong in outward communication and stink on picking up the emotional context of anything. <laughs> Yeah, I like that. Um, so, so the color theory chart you can buy as a book, and then basically it it, it folds out, so you get mm. your three D shape because each page is differently shaped. So it makes gotcha. it make, it makes a sphere if you open up all of the leaves of the pages and make them equidistant. Um, so, so your radar chart is slicing it on the other axis. Yeah. Um, which might be more interesting. So um, well, e easier to communicate. I don't know if it's actually more interesting. It sounds like what you're describing is more interesting, but you know, applying the advice I had from the, the two brightest people I know in 3D <laughs> stuff. Keep it simple, uh, stupid. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, Dr. Stuart Desson um, is the um, psychologist behind Lumina and their personality profiler. Um, and basically, um, that's like the big four, and it measures the antithesis of each. So it shows your level of extroversion and introversion on the same scale. So you basically have yeah, a 32-point circle with the antithesis of all of the subdomains of the big four and how far you are opposite each other all the way around. So it's almost like that, but based on trait, and if those traits are then relating to behaviors or communication styles or EQ, let's not get into a whole conversation of whether or not. Well, EQ brings up something interesting. Uh, <laughs> and, and well, what it brings up interesting to me is we, we accept that uh, IQ varies across humanity, that there's some people who are absolute geniuses. You know, we take Einstein. Obviously, credit as being, you know, quite quite a genius. And who who knows what the IQ number? I think the numbers are somewhat. It, it's it's like taking the uh, the autism test. It can vary by the day. <laughs> well, it just so, so so I also had something recently that between 1920, 1940, and today, there's been something like a twenty or thirty point variance in the IQ test as we've developed the IQ test. So mm. those people who would have scored um, an 80 in 1940 would score 100 today because of how we now measure IQ. So um, mm. if he which was is, 200 which is, in right, 1930, which, then he'd be off the chart. Yeah, that's, that's pretty <laughs> funny because uh, 80 is getting to the point of, you know, essentially having an intellectual disability. Um so we've now bumped that up to 100, which is average. You know, 100 was designed on the, the thing as being average. So I guess we're saying that the world has gotten stupider as we've uh, more well, stupid as we've gone along. Well, so this goes back to Tim's very first point as we open it to say, <laughs> well, there, there are some dumb people in the world. Um, so I heard a comedian um, a few months ago. He was like, imagine how dumb the average person is. And then realize that half the world are dumber than that. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly it. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, I was going to say on EQ is when we look at IQ, we, we recognize there's a distribution. Yeah. And, and we don't think that you can particularly change your IQ. I mean, the whole idea of IQ is that it's, it's your innate ability quotient of, of intellect. Uh, you know, can we educate you and teach you more in particular aspects? Yes. But does that raise your IQ? No. Uh, it doesn't raise your innate ability to process and in, in such information. You just bought another volume of the encyclopedia. Uh, it didn't make you better at reading it. You just got another volume. Yeah. So why is it that we take IQ? And I think there is such a thing as uh, um, in, or what, what, EQ. We take EQ. Yeah, emotional. 
measurement. A quotient, yes. And, and I think there is such a thing. I think so there are people who are much better at it and there's much people who are much worse at it. So why is it we think EQ is A, everybody should be at some level that's all just superior, um, and B, that we can go learn to be better at our EQ? Um, that, that kind of contradicts the way we look at IQ. So if IQ is innate, I think EQ is innate too, and there's going to be a range. There's going to be people who are very, very sensitive to it. Um, and there's going to be people who, you know, oh, like me, are as dumb as a brick. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, I didn't say that. You said that. <laughs> I, I do. I, I own it. You know, I, I claim it. I own it. Uh, and, I, you know, I, I had the wonderful fortune of, uh, of studying with the best vocal coach in the world, which is how I've learned to speak the way that I speak and be able to communicate emotional sounds in my speaking. Because I, I used to talk in the traditional autistic monotone, just every word's the same length and everyone's in the same note and I'm boring as shit and you don't want to listen to me for more than about two seconds before you, you know, turn off the dial. Uh, but he, he, he trained me. And one of the things he, he teaches is the sounds of emotions. Because every emotion has a, a mix of sounds. And, and there's really only five, five components of voice. And uh, you can mix those five components in different ways to get the sounds of different emotions. So I've learned to make them. I can do it outwardly. I've done it so much now. It's just, it's pretty natural for me. The problem is, I can't use it for interpretation unless I'm not participating in the conversation because it takes too much processing power to sit and pick a part of, okay, the melody is doing this, the volume is doing this, the, you know, the tone is doing this. The, and from those five components, I could trace it back to you know, an emotional. That person piece. sounds angry. <laughs> right. But it, it takes it takes too long if you're actually in the conversation. So it's it's kind of uh, it's kind of interesting. People assume that I have, I guess, a fairly high emotional quotient because I can speak in an emotional manner. But no, I don't. I, I have a very low emotional quotient and I have a logical approach to deducing emotions, which only works if I'm not having to think about anything else. <laughs> That's perfectly fair, perfectly reasonable. Which, which means if I'm in the heat of the battle where the emotional thing is going on, chances are I am uh, clueless. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and the answer you'll get will be perfectly logical, not very tactful, and absolutely truthful. <laughs> you know, speaking of that, I, I was at a uh, seminar uh, this uh, past week, and one of the, the gentlemen that's there uh, is... Uh, I don't know what his title is, Grand Puba, um, of a, uh, a mid-sized company, uh, been around for, I don't know, 100 years or something. And um, he is a very, um, you know, his uh, EQ is extremely high and he runs everything from a very person-centered point of view. And I, I on the other hand, have the EQ that is very low and uh, run everything from a logical point of view. And, and we were discussing that we should actually write a book together uh, of the, uh, you know, a book of management looking at individual situations and logically what would be a good answer, but emotionally what would be a good answer. And it's amazing how much they vary. You know, for instance, he was telling me about a, uh, a person they had that embezzled from them. And you know, what, what did they do versus, uh, you know, what did he do versus what I would do? You know, my, my answer would be uh, 911, come get him, haul him away and, uh, you know, throw the bum in jail. They, they didn't want to ruin his uh, future prospects and all that. And they just quietly dismissed him and let him go. And uh, when somebody called for a, uh, a um, you know, reference, just said, you know, he worked here from here to here. Well, um, but, but, but somebody with a higher level of compassion might have sat him down, found out what was going on in their life, found out why they needed all of this extra money, lent them the extra money, let them keep their job, um, and then said, look, we all make mistakes. We're all in a hard time. 
they, they, I guess you know whatever the reason they, they did they did have a sit down and talk with him you know him about that but it uh, it didn't work out um, now now he was telling me another situation where they had a uh, another embezzlement situation uh, which would would make me logically say you need to look at your financial controls but um, but uh, th th this person had uh, embezzled uh, you know millions and they they did take the person's home from them. But other than that, they didn't, no charges, no anything. And, and this person ended up, uh, uh, I, I don't know, k killing two different people. Um, and, you know, so it, it kind of goes back to they did what it felt like was an emo you know, emotionally the correct way to handle it. But uh, um, you know, logic, yeah. lo logic says, uh, you know, somebody that's a crook still a crook. Um, <laughs> So I don't know. It was just interesting. It was an interesting discussion with him, a guy I've known for a number of years. And we, we always uh, have interesting discussions because we come at him from completely opposite ends. And, and we're both, um, uh, uh, I guess you would say, uh, uh, very uh, adamant about our positions. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, so we're coming to the end of our time. Um, is there anything today that you wanted to talk about that we have? Anything I want to talk about that we haven't, you know, I, I guess the one thing that uh, that I, I, I we we danced around it a little bit, but we we didn't really you know dig into it real deep is I, I really think that neurodiversity needs to become just part of diversity. And my my logic on it is, if you go and look at diversity, what what's the whole point of diversity? It's not to get people with X chromosomes, you know, two X's and an X and a Y and people that have dark skin and people that have light skin and people that grew, you know, were born in, in this region versus people born in that region. I mean, a, you know, the goal is to be, uh, to be fair uh, to all humans. But the business benefit of it is each person because of their different situation, their different upbringing, their different culture, their diff, you know, hormonal differences, I mean, all, all different you know, reasons, has a unique perspective to bring. And the more unique perspectives that we can bring to the table, the better decision that we can make. So I actually think neurodiversity is really the, the superset of all diversity, because when you think about it, neurodiversity is only about unique perspectives. When we've thrown out the book of, we don't care, you know, white skin, black skin, male, female, whatever, you know, being, uh, being neurodistinct does not discriminate. You can be in any single group you want, and you can also be any neurodistinct category that exists. So I, I really think it gives a, a healthier way to look at it versus looking at it as being this group was marginalized or this group and looking at it as what do we get? by embracing these different groups. Because that's, of course, how we promote neurodiversity is what you get is unique perspectives. Well, that's what you really get is unique perspectives. We, we don't have to have the markers to look for unique perspectives. We just have to look at how do we enable people to share their unique perspective based upon who cares whether it was the way your brain was working or that you had bad parents. It gave you a unique perspective. <laughs> uh, so I, I think that is really the healthy direction that this needs to go into is that we look at bringing out the unique perspectives. But if we're going to bring them out, we now have to actually value them. And I, I always say that I feel valued when people will consider my perspective as if it potentially could be right. And the potentially is the important part. It could be 100% wrong, but you'll at least look at it and say, that's a different way than I saw it. Let me look at it and see if there's maybe something there. No, it doesn't quite fit the situation. But I feel valued as a human because you, you considered this unique perspective that you hired me for in the first place. <laughs> So that that's my uh, my soapbox, uh, you know, thing of, I think the neurodiversity movement needs to move into being a part of diversity, and really, it is the 
superset of all diversity. And uh, I'm I've I've been of the mindset that difference causes conflict, and it's how we manage that conflict um, determines whether harms created or innovations created. So there will always be conflict because we aren't the same people. You know, there will always be disagreements. But if we can manage those differences empathetically, compassionately, curiously, then we might learn something. <laughs> I, I would say out of the three, curious to me is, is the most important one. Um, you know, I, I'm not necessarily particularly highly empathetic, but uh, but I'm highly curious. So even if I disagree with you, I always say that the best person to have a good conversation with is somebody that totally disagrees with you on a point. If they can stand back far enough emotionally to actually discuss what their viewpoint is. And they're at least open to the possibility that they might be wrong. Oh, I don't even care if they think that they might be wrong. <laughs> if, if they can just, uh, if they can explain how they see it and how they view it, I'm richer for having that new perspective, whether I adopt the perspective or simply look at it as, geez, I, that's a different way to see it. It doesn't fit for me, but I now can understand more why, you know, they, they look at it that way. Um, so no, I don't even think that they, you know, for me, they don't have to, I, I'm not trying to debate them and getting them to change their mind. I, I want somebody that can explain their position in a way that I can understand their position. And if they want to stay in that position, that is perfectly fine. It was the willingness to share it in a way I could understand it that I value. So being curious instead of mad. You know, I may disagree with you completely on whatever it is, but I'd rather be curious about it and understand why do you see it that way versus just getting mad at you and thinking that you're a jerk because you think that. Um, what did that get out of it? I got not, there was zero, actually there was negative value in that one because now I'm worked up, I'm, I'm stressed out <laughs> and I'm reacting less well to everything else. Yeah, I, I'm... A recent conversation due to a recent conflict in the Middle East has spawned similar conversations in the house. But why are you yep. thinking about it that way? Well, let's sit down and have a conversation about that. <laughs> right, right. Um, yes, uh, yes. Yeah, so all I can say is uh, it, it really hit me. I, I logged in last night and checked my uh, my work email and uh, reading about um, uh, the security for the company, trying to trace down every employee that's in Israel. Um, kind of really brought home what's going on. I, I'm not saying good, bad on one side or another side, but just the, well, the all sheer of scope of what's happening. Anything, anything that results in people dying is bad. Right. I think but we yeah, just agree the, that. <laughs> you know, just, just the sheer scope when it's actually, you know, the company you work for is trying to make sure that their employees are, are okay. safe, that they're okay. Um, and I'm not, you know, I'm not picking sides. I'm not saying, you know, I'm saying it's bad all the way around. It's, yeah, that bottom line is bad all the way around. <laughs> cool. Right. So we're approaching the end of our time. Um, I just wanted to thank you for two hours, or very nearly two hours, of um, all kinds of conversations around um, distinctness, not deviantness, um, <laughs> neurodiversity being diversity, um, the benefit of diversity of thought and opinion, um, and so much more geeks but not nerds um i think that might be an americanism because yeah nerd is definitely more of a derogatory term that side of the pond um yeah yeah that's what i think to me it's it's, it's how derogatory it is like geeks are you know it's, it's okay to be a geek you're just you know you don't get cornered in a party by them but uh but they're, they're okay people but nerds well, that's a different story you know, they, they don't take baths and you know all that kind of stuff <laughs> <laughs> perfect tim well thanks very much for coming on well, thank you so much for having me. This has been just a, a wonderful uh, time, a great conversation. Really enjoyed myself.